out, it's too late. Would everyone please take their seats? Hearing that I'll resume, we will now recognize our second panel, Mr. Den Black is the former chief engineer at Delphi Corporation. Mr. Bruce Gump is a former senior engineer at Delphi Corporation. Ms. Mary Miller formerly provided human resource leadership at Delphi Corporation's brake assembly operations. And Mr. Tom Rose is a former plant manager at Delphi. Again, you saw in the first panel, pursuant to our rules of our committee, all witnesses are to be uh, sworn. Would you please rise and take the oath? Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and to help you God? I do. Let the record indicate all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. As you saw in the first panel, I thank and reward those who stay within five minutes. <laughs> uh, I'm a little less thankful if you go over, and if you go far over, I will have to ask you to come to a stop, and I'd like you to end on a high note, which is best done when the yellow light is on. And so that, with that, I believe we're uh, starting with Mr. Black. The gentleman's recognized. Thank you for the opportunity for this panel to share the story of the Delphi Salaried Retirees Association and to ask that this committee leave here today with a renewed determination to ensure that an immediate end to our 32-month-long search for justice is forthcoming. My name is Dennis Black. I'm trained as a mechanical engineer and spent my career spanned 36 years with General Motors and Delphi Corporations, 34 years with GM and only two years with Delphi. During my career, I served GM in a large variety of capacities, including project engineer, engineering supervisor, chief engineer of two business units, chief engineer for global future products, global quality management, and divisional strategic planning. Along the way, I was fortunate enough to be the inventor of what has turned out to be a game-changing innovation in the field of providing automotive air conditioning comfort for millions of vehicle owners around the globe. This was the first infinitely variable displacement AC compressor that has literally created tens of thousands of living wage jobs around the globe. Subsequently, jobs that have allowed workers to support their families since the mid-1980s. This innovation has been emulated by every major competitor and as a result, everyone in the globe has, has followed our lead. I was honored to receive General Motors' highest engineering honor, the Boss Cutting Award, for in inventions considered to be of particular significance to General Motors. Now, please understand that I only tell you this to emphasize that it is the salary workers of General Motors in Delphi whose historical role has been to first imagine, then design and develop the automotive products and production facilities. Without question, the salary workers have made tremendous contributions to the American auto industry, and our contributions were in no way less valuable than those of our union counterparts. I've served as a chairperson for the Delphi Salary Retirees Association since its inception in early February 2009, 12, 1,012 very long and stressful days ago. The DSRA seeks to represent the interests of as many as 20,000 Delphi salary retirees supervisors, accountants, administrators, administrative assistants, technicians, and engineers whose economic futures have been intentionally and needlessly torn asunder since our ordeal began. As I mentioned, we organized DSRA in February 2009, and subsequently we have left absolutely no stone unturned in our efforts to seek justice. We've taken our story to the federal courts, to our congressional officials, to the GAO, to SIGTARP, to our union counterparts, to the national and local media everywhere. We have expended several million dollars in our unrelenting quest, dollars that many simply cannot afford to contribute due to their depleted financial resources. Nevertheless, they find a way to contribute anyhow. We will never, never cease our unrelenting quest for justice until we obtain the pension benefits that we earned after a lifetime of playing by the rules. We've collected hundreds of human impact testimonials and a large sampling of these have been submitted for the hearing record. However, uh, they tell the story of damage already done as a result of the loss of benefits earned over a lifetime.
by folks who simply play by the rules. However, they do not tell of the damage to come in the next 10 to 30 years. They do not tell of victims who have not yet drowned, those who continue to slowly sink like sinking in quicksand due to negative cash flows which insidiously deplete their monetary reserves. Fortunately, my wife and I have not yet drowned, not yet, <laughs> but it's entirely possible that we could succumb due to the huge pension losses imposed upon us in the years to come. Here's just one letter from an Ohio resident to share with you. He wrote this on November 3rd, following a November 1st Detroit News article by David Shepherson entitled Ratner Applauds Auto Bailout's Happy Ending. I'm a Delphi Sour retiree. The Delphi story may have uh, been a happy ending for Mr. Ratner, who's all warm and fuzzy to the point of almost crying tears of joy, but for many of us, myself being one, we've been crying tears of pain and anguish over what Delphi did to us. The remainder of his letter, which is anguishing indeed, and only an indication of hundreds more, uh, is in the, in the record. And he is sitting right here in the audience, by the way, Mr. David Kane. Since those first chaotic days in, of DSRA, we've come a long way with regard to our factual understanding of how we have become hapless victims of the discriminatory actions of our federal government's executive branch. These actions have resulted in egregious harm to thousands while using taxpayer dollars. We've learned that the earned pension benefits of non-union Delphi retirees have been slashed by as much as 30, uh, 70 percent as a result of needless and inappropriate termination of our Delphi salary pension funds by the pen to the Pension Benefit Security Corporation. We, of course, have learned that we were singled out as losers by the executive branch, while the earned pension benefits of our union counterparts were kept whole by a top-up. Let me be extremely clear, though. We do not for a moment begrudge the fact that our union counterparts have remained whole and they are, they are receiving the pension benefits that they earned over decades, but we cannot abide by the loss of our earned pension benefits. In addition, our ordeal has caught the attention of a growing number of media sources that include Fox News, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, The Daily Caller, The Detroit News, and many more. Also, our story has been reported in a recent 2011 book by David Fredoso of the Washington Examiner, Chapter 2, Stop Us If You Can, Saving the UH, UAW as Recommended Reading for All. Finally, we've learned that our congressional requests for full disclosure have consistently been ignored and obstructed by the executive branch. And in closing, our situation is not complicated. Very simply, our major union counterparts receive taxpayer-provided top-ups to keep their earned pension benefits whole. In contrast, our non-union Delphi people did not receive equal treatment. This is wrong. This was needless. This is illegal. All that we require of our federal government is fair and equitable treatment. And we Thank you. Your entire it. statement will be placed in the record. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gump. Chairman, I think. By, by the way, only senators get to filibuster. <laughs> 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 Mr. Gump. Congressman Issa, Congressman Turner, and members of the committee, thank you for another opportunity to explain our issues and the effective treatment that we have received at the hands of the Obama administration and the PBGC has had on our members and the nation, and to request your help in resolving those issues. I'm here to represent the more than 20,000 Delphi salaried retirees. Please understand that the salaried retirees work as secretaries, technicians, and engineers, as well as supervisors and managers. We worked hard. We did what we were told. <coughs> We did everything right, and we expected to be paid for our efforts, both with our wages and the deferred compensation known as a modest pension. But when our government stepped in, they chose to protect only their favored groups and throw us out like yesterday's cat. The effects of this treatment have been devastating. My own story includes the fact that my wife and I have four children, all currently in college. Paying for health and life insurance plus tuition, housing, and loans takes 90% of my monthly pension. Our other expenses like utilities, mortgage, fuel, food, medicine require us to spend my wife's small income plus some of our savings each month. We calculate that so far over the last 30 months we have spent more than $60,000 we had not planned to spend this early in my retirement. The future outlook is getting worse for us just because I was a salaried worker instead of a member of a group our government chose to protect. I've warned our children that they must be prepared to prove their commercial necessity to our government as in the end, that's all that matters. <coughs> Citizenship, contribution to society, planning or effort don't matter at all. That is the lesson in all this. Government, the PBGC, and industry are not to be trusted. 
The story of Mary Ann Hudrick is no better. She lost 40% of her earned pension. That, along with a 500% increase in the cost of health care insurance for herself and her self-employed husband, has resulted in them having to spend down their savings much faster than planned. Her husband has a degenerative disease and so cannot always work, but no work means no pay when one is self-employed. Mary Ann's a fighter, though, and as the chairman of the group that she works on, I will guess that she has spent more than 7,000 hours over the last 30 months working to have this situation corrected. Mary Ann could not be here today because she has depleted her own physical resources uh, and has contracted mononucleosis. I guarantee you she will continue to fight for us. Jim Kane is here today. While working for Delphi in Mexico, he contracted a virus that destroyed the hearing in his right ear. Even though his superintendent told him to get whatever health care was needed, he ended up spending more than $12,000 out of his own retirement savings to pay for it. When he was involuntarily terminated, he lost his life and health care insurance, and then the PBGC reduced his pension by 30%. He has since had a heart attack and has developed diabetes. His retirement savings are now gone. He can no longer provide for his wife or himself. Living on the reduced pension alone is extremely difficult and may not be possible over time. <coughs> he says, I want what was promised to survive with some dignity in my final years. I want justice. That's what we all want. What was promised to survive with dignity and justice. The stories you hear today are just examples and just the beginning. They will get worse as time goes forward, the economy, economy takes its toll, and savings are depleting. Many of our members have already had to declare personal bankruptcy, some seeing their homes foreclosed. We've had to endure additional health issues from the stress and conditions and because we can't always afford to get preventative care. I knew a coworker who delayed going to the doctor while he worked for a, at a part-time job to earn enough to cover the expense. He knew something didn't feel right and by the time he did see his doctor and was diagnosed, it was too late. He died in just a few weeks. On a larger scope, there are indications the effects on the retirees are causing economic problems in our communities too. In an area where I live in Northeast Ohio, a recent Brookings Institute study determined that Youngstown, Ohio has the highest concentration of poverty in the nation. The poverty rate there calculated to be 49.7%. I saw an article in the local newspaper that 30% of the dwellings in Warren, Ohio are unoccupied. A nine-story bank building in good condition directly across the street from the courthouse was recently sold at auction for $75,000. A study by Youngstown State University requested by Congressman Tim Ryan pr predicted that the pension issue alone would cost the local economy $58 million per year or $145 million so far. When the cost of health care issue for all the Delphi retirees is added in, that jumps to $400 million lost to the local economy so far. Adding in retirees from Dayton and Columbus and Sandusky, the losses in economic activity in Ohio are now over $1.2 billion. Nationally, it's about $4 billion, all because our government incorrectly chose to treat us as having no commercial necessity. The PBGC was willing to play along. These losses will continue to grow for decades if they're not corrected. The PBGC has chosen to defy the federal court. They're denying us access to documents from people we requested. And one must ask why. And the only answer I can think of is that they feel that the consequences of defying the federal court are not as bad as complying with it. Here's one area where you can help. We need transparency on the actions of the PBGC and the administration regarding the treatment of the Delphi salaried retirees. <coughs> we have a summarized. We have lots of, of support, including uh, the UAW, the Ohio AFL-CIO. The Senate in Ohio unanimously passed a resolution saying that all the retirees should be treated fairly. The state Democratic parties in both Ohio and Michigan, the Democratic Party, said that everybody should be treated fairly. We need your help, and we ask, you, we ask you help to end this nightmare and reverse the precedent set by this administration and the PBGC so that we and those behind us will not have to deal with the same horrible issues. Help us stop the slide down the financial cliff. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mary. Thank you, Congressman, <coughs> for inviting me to testify today. I am Mary Miller. It is an honor and privilege to be here. I'm here to tell you how the GM bailout has shattered my plans for retirement and to ask you to fix this shameful injustice. I worked for 22 years for General Motors and nine for Delphi. 
While I held many different positions over my 31-year career, one of the jobs I held for quite some time was to partner with an appointed hourly employee to manage the UAW and GM and Delphi training funds. I am still good friends with this coworker. While he continues to receive the full pension and health care benefits he earned, I do not. How can it be legal for the government to pick winners and losers amongst its own citizens? Why did the administration deem my friend and his family as more valuable to America than my family and me? For me and many of my fellow retirees, the burden of trying to figure out how to make ends meet gets heavier every day. Let me tell you a little more about me, what my plan was for retirement, and what will happen to my plan unless you can fix this disaster. I am a mother of four young adults, ages 20 to 26. I am a homeowner, a taxpayer, a person of deep faith, and a law-abiding citizen. I am divorced. As a single mom, I have long been the main provider for my four children. Prior to losing my job at Delphi, I was a human resources manager. I am a professional certified coach. I started my own business, MTM, Transformation Coaching, after I lost my job at Delphi. Being only 57, I knew I needed to start a new career to earn additional income. Due to the recessionary economy, it has been very challenging to build my coaching practice. In 2009, Delphi stripped its retirees of all promised health care coverage. That means retirees under the age of 65 have to purchase it. In my case, that means the cost for health care from my family has increased from $179 a month in 2008 to $787 a month now, even with HTTC benefits. This means I cannot afford to provide health care coverage for my three sons who are in college. I feel that I have failed my children when I can't help to provide the basics while they are full-time students. And sadly, that was just the beginning of the retiree's horror story. Just a few months later, the bottom fell out when the PBGC took over the Delphi pensions. The PB PBGC slashed my pension check by 30%. This isn't a situation that can be remedied by just cutting out all discretionary spending. I am struggling to pay for the basics, to keep my 10-year-old car running, to pay my property taxes, and to make critical home repairs. Even though I bought health insurance for myself, I was not able to afford a CAT scan my doctor ordered last June. When I learned that my portion of the bill would be $278, I had to cancel the test. I have been put in this crushing position because the government intentionally chose to treat me and all Delphi salaried retirees with absolute disdain and disregard. What does the future hold? Without your help to resolve this travesty, I won't be able to maintain my own home or pay for my own medical needs. How can it be that a person who put herself through graduate school worked hard for, at two Fortune 500 companies for over 31 years, earned a comfortable pension and health care benefits to have in retirement, will live for golden years in such poverty. How can it be legal for the government to pick winners and losers amongst its own citizens? I have learned that when you're in the right, you don't back down. We will never give up our fight to regain our full pensions. Please take up our cause and help us to regain the full pensions we earned and so desperately need. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rose. Uh, thank you and good morning. Uh, my name is Tom Rose. I'm a salaried retiree from uh, Delphi, having worked 30 years for General Motors and another nine years for Delphi. My entire career has been spent working at five of the former eight Delphi plants in Dayton. I grew up in Nashville, graduated from college, served our country in the military, including a year in Vietnam, met a wonderful girl in Dayton, married, three children, all of whom graduated from college and are themselves married with two grandchildren. My working career began as a young engineer at the local GM plant on the Wisconsin Boulevard and included many different management jobs, including plant manager at the Kettering Boulevard plant. I was fortunate to lead many talented salaried and union people as we delivered quality parts to our customers on time. 
our plants and people contributed greatly to the local economy. I am now using retirement savings at a much faster rate than originally planned to compensate for my missing pension dollars. The careful financial plan for retirement that my wife and I were taught to achieve was wiped out and became meaningless. My wife and I are paying three times more for our health care than with Delphi, even with HCTC, and we are paying for it with 40% fewer pension dollars. We use what little is left to help fund the DSRA lawsuit to correct what never should have happened in the first place. A successful retirement for my wife and I is now in jeopardy. Salaried and union employees work for the same company, were in the identical situation, in many instances work side by side, but were treated in distinctly different manners. The current administration created solutions in which our pensions were sacrificed to help enable GM's emergence from a choreographed bankruptcy in a record 44 days. You have heard some of how my wife and I have been impacted. I would like to share input from other salaried retirees. In Saginaw, Michigan, my unemployment ran out, so I'm really underwater right now. I am using my savings account to pay my bills, but that is quickly dwindling, and I may have to sell my house by springtime and find a cheap place to live. Dayton, Ohio, this past year has been hard for me. I am making it through, but just by a thread. I had to borrow money from my family this month to make it to payday. Cicero, Indiana, I have great difficulty providing even the basics for my family. I am appalled and enraged at the treatment I am receiving in retirement. As a result of this discrimination, my annual income is more than $6,500 below poverty level guidelines. Boyne City, Michigan, the 30% reduction in my pension has put my wife and me in a situation where in order to make ends meet, we have to live apart Monday through Friday, working in two separate towns. I've been blessed with a wonderful wife. We've been married for 35 years, and this is the first time in my career that we've been separated on a regular basis. It's very hard on both of us. Sandusky, <clears throat> what makes what has been done to us so damnable is this. We're in an age and state of health where we can't bounce back. There's too little time remaining and too little opportunity available. I don't want a handout, but I do want a hand back of what was taken from me. Earlier in my testimony, I mentioned we were forced into a legal effort to gain back that which we had earned and was denied us by the administration. In closing, please let me give you two brief examples of exceptional sacrifice and the tenacity of our membership. Bonita Springs, Florida. I've been pretty well consumed caring for my wife who has had a recurrence of breast cancer this spring. I've just sent $40 through PayPal and next month I'll send $35. Sorry I can't do more, but we have some large medical bills this year. West Carrollton, Ohio. In April, I took a part-time job along with my full-time day job. I would get up at 5 a.m. and return home at 11 p.m. I soon had to quit my part-time job for concerns about my health and lack of rest. After 39 and a half years at GM Delphi, I never imagined I would be working two jobs to try and support my family. I am doubling what I would normally give to our cause. I hope someday that we will prevail. I feel that time is on the PBGC side by dragging this out and not cooperating. This may someday deplete our funds in a way we can't support our lawyers. Members of the committee, these are real people, real lives, real impact. More than 20,000 current and future Delphi salary retirees and our families are appealing to the Oversight Committee today to hold the administration responsible to correct this injustice. We are not asking for a handout or an entitlement, only the deferred compensation that was earned by us but taken away by the executive branch of our own government. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Rose. As I said to the earlier panel, I'm going to ask each panel substantially the same question. And I know some of you may have slightly different opinions on it. Um, and I'll preface it by saying, you know, when I worked for General Motors, I was a machinist uh, in the Aerospace Workers Union in Cleveland. Um, enjoyed the job, enjoyed the benefits, didn't stay for a career. But I knew at that time I was represented uh, by a powerful union that had a lot of clout. None of you were represented by a powerful union that had a lot of clout. What part do you believe not being represented by a union played in the decision 
to have people like Mr. Block and all of you who had special skills, some might say harder to duplicate skills than a line worker in many cases, choose to have retirees of that category receive only what was in the bank, so to speak, versus union workers who were chopped off. Anyone can answer, but I want to make sure we go away with the record clear about why you might make a decision that one group is important versus another. Is there any reason you can find other than, in fact, the clout of the union and its influence on the administration? Uh, the reason is the involvement of the United States government. The issue here is, is that the government stepped into this with our dollars, with our money, right, and allowed gentlemen to make totally different decisions than they would have had that not happened. In the end, our, the Treasury knew that the uh, folks who are represented by the union tend to support them very strongly. Uh, and so there's even some testimony uh, that's already been offered in depositions uh, that indicates that the uh, political sensitivity of certain groups was a uh, criteria that was considered uh, during the bailout. Uh, so we know that that was one of the things that was uh, an issue. I do not believe that the UAW would have uh, struck General Motors, which was already in bankruptcy and in danger of liquidation, because that would have ruined all of the jobs uh, for all of their members at, at General Motors. Uh, they would have found some other way uh, to have uh, worked and, and uh, tried to make their point with General Motors. But, but I don't think they would have been General Your belief is that it was more of the political importance to the current administration rather than the likelihood of a strike leading to crippling in let, let, me, let me comment also and Please. reiterate what was mentioned in the prior testimony, and that was uh, immediately uh, when the plan of reorganization for General Motors was announced, it immediately was said that the UAW, our UAW counterparts would be chopped up, but the other major unions were left out of that. Some weeks passed before it eventually came that the decision was changed to also chop up our IUE counterparts and steel workers, okay? Uh, that alone is indicative of why was it, if they all had contractual agreements, why did it happen? And of course, clearly why it happened, especially in this state of Ohio, which I'm a Buckeye and, and started my, my job with uh, IUE uh, representation here, is that IUE is very, very, very powerful in Ohio. And the decision to change and include the IUE clearly had it to do with political considerations, not contractual considerations. Mr. Rose. Uh, I, I, I concur. Uh, as you heard Mr. Gebbia's testimony, there was no financial justification given the uh, you know, actuarial funding level of the pension plan. So what else happened? Uh, it's my personal belief that uh, when the federal government interjected itself into the GM bankruptcy process, and we can only wonder why they did, but to me, it uh, clearly was uh, the Delphi pension plan was an obstacle to quickly getting GM out of bankruptcy. So they dealt with it in a way that I believe favored the current administration politically. Well, I, uh, I also serve on the Judiciary Committee, and I was there for bankruptcy reform. Uh, Mr. Gordon also serves on the committee. The amazing thing to me is that uh, we, we in government we don't need a constitution for the powerful. We don't need laws for the powerful. We need the constitution and, and laws for the weak. Ultimately, the success of our democracy is about the minority having rights, not the majority. If you want to see the majority have rights, just go to any third world country and see who's in charge. They don't need any more government than, they, than in fact, a one party. So I can only say this to you and, and to all of the salaried employees that have, uh, have suffered now and, and will continue to suffer until there's a resolution, that this committee will look into both the bankruptcy inequities and, in fact, the misconduct that we believe may in part have come out of Treasury and come out of the administration to see if we can't get a full disclosure and then rectification once that has been has seen the light of day. I, I know that's not enough while you're continuing to suffer, but it is what we will do, and uh, this committee will additionally make public such documents as we can from our discovery. 
Now, that won't necessarily be the document you want, but it's our intention to be as transparent as we can be, and particularly when we get into the details of Treasury, what they did, why they did it, uh, and what they didn't tell all of you. With that, I recognize the former chairman of the committee, Mr. Fritz. I think these, uh, these stories that we've heard from you are heart-rendering. It, it uh, makes you kind of ashamed that, uh, that our government uh, uh, even considers doing these sorts of things. We've got a, another investigation going on right now with the Na uh, National Labor Relations Board where they're uh, trying to use uh, political muscle to uh, force uh, uh, unionism on a company down in South Carolina. It's a different issue, but once again, you've got the federal government, this administration, trying to uh, control uh, the people of this country instead of working for the people of this country. And I think it's very sad. I don't have any questions. Thank you, gentlemen. Sure. Thank you, Mr. After uh, about 40 days of uh, <coughs> continuing uh, discussions by the IUE and the steel workers, uh, a miraculous thing happened, and it was decided that we will also top them up. Go ahead, please. I'm sorry, you, ever, you asked at the last hearing to get a copy of the first discussion plan. Yeah, we, 
appropriately and limited redacted portion of that uh, as soon as it's been reviewed by, by Council. As you know, our committee uh, has a unilateral right to determine what we will or won't release. We try to be considerate, but certainly this is something that has a huge public interest. Mr. Officer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Let me uh, first of all take a moment to thank all of you for, for being here today. I think it's important that you share the stories that you have with this committee so we understand the impact, the direct impact it's having on you all and other families. This is very important. I know the last few years have been extremely difficult for you and, and your families, but we appreciate your determination to ensure that every Delphi retiree receives a fair pension. But what I'd like to ask you is about, uh, and you've touched on this, is the reduced pensions. I know, Ms. Ms. Miller, you, you mentioned that you're Pension has been reduced another 30 percent. Uh, Mr. Gump, I think you talked about somebody who had a 49 percent loss. Um, and as you know, the federal uh, law limits the maximum benefit a person can receive through the PBGC under a partially funded pension plan. Uh, the limit is based on the year the plan was terminated or went bankrupt and does not include an adjustment for inflation. Uh, as a result, not only have Delphi salary employees had pensions cut as I mentioned earlier, and you have mentioned also between 30, as much as 70 percent uh, with our discussions, Mr. Rose, last week. Uh, but each year, and this is the point I'm trying to make, each year your pension has less and less purchasing power. Uh, can you describe for the committee how this has impacted your lives? Uh, and, and also, um, uh, Mr. Black, you talked about the future. I mean, in planning for the future when you have less and less purchasing power. Yeah, inevitably, uh, uh, of course, uh, now there are signs that that evil inflation rating might be picking up steam, especially if you're trying to buy gasoline or food. So uh, indeed, uh, you know, those who have not suffered complete economic wreckage yet will most certainly suffer it in the next decade or two, should they be unfortunate enough to live that long. <laughs> Bottom line. I would like to, to point out, you know, you talk about the 49.7 percent. That's actually the, the level of, of concentrated poverty in Youngstown, Ohio, is what I found there. That same study, by the way, pointed up that for every million dollars lost, about 30 people downstream of us will also lose their job. Uh, so go do the math. Uh, $161 million in the Mahoning Valley alone up in northeast Ohio, uh, that's nearly 5,000 people that were <coughs> waitresses and, and service workers and, you know, uh, electricians and plumbers that might do the workforce, they lose their jobs too because we're not out participating in the economy anymore, right? That's the effect, the commercial necessity, if you will, of including that. But the government chose to not do that because it wasn't just commercial necessity, it was also political necessity, right? We're absolutely convinced of that. Let me, if one, one follow-up real sure. quick, Mr. Chairman, if I can. Uh, in the short time allotted. You, you, today, I think all four of you expressed uh, your frustration with government and the numerous hardships that it's been put, that's been put on you as a result of what's happened. And I know many of uh, the retirees feel betrayed by the government because the administration's quest to quickly resolve uh, the Delphi bankruptcy without adequate consideration for the effects on retirees. Um, and I know this panel and, and I know this committee and many of my colleagues have worked very hard uh, to, to help uh, your cause through the hearings uh, and, and requesting this information from uh, information from the administration. But I also know there's been obstacles and roadblocks that have been put forward you know, with government and also with members of Congress. I know we want to continue to work hard. I've co-sponsored bills. There's been letters that we have sent that we have taken lead on and working, coordinating with you. But what are some of those roadblocks that you've been faced with in, in trying to work with government and trying to work with Congress in particular? First of all, the, the reluctance both the Treasury and PBGC to allow any transparency. They essentially tell us that we should be glad to be able to get anything at all. Um, while our next door neighbors are out buying boats and taking vacations because they were members of the union. Um, I think that's probably the most difficult. There are some, some obvious political issues. Uh, one party versus another, those kinds of issues have, have played a role. What we found was is that if we do get an opportunity to speak to the right people, 
and explain the realities of the decisions that they're making, they tend to carve out niches uh, in their ideologies to uh, um, try to work against that. Um, I would point up that, that we do have support on both sides of the aisle, you know, very strong support. Uh, in fact, two of our very best supporters up to, up to now have been Senator Brown and Congressman Ryan, both Democrats. Um, we've also, you know, that's not to leave out uh, you know, your committee and, and others on, on that side of the aisle. The point I'm trying to make is, is that this really isn't an issue of, of one party versus another. The parties themselves have chosen to say this is wrong. This is an issue of right and wrong, and that's why they're protecting it. That's why they don't want to let anything out. They know they did wrong. They don't want to admit it. They don't want to allow anything out. So they're going to go to the mat and prevent anybody <coughs> from learning what happened. That's where they need your help. So in, in a nutshell, of course, the roadblock has been the uh, utter unwillingness to have transparency, utter unwillingness. And even federal judges are slapped upside the head when they say <laughs> you're going to be transparent. That's the problem. Thank we're we're going to have a very limited okay. second. Yeah. We're going to have a very limited second round. Uh, what I would add for, for all of you, I think we've done a good job of explaining for the record uh, that this is not about bringing down the successes of a union looking out, or several unions looking out for the benefit of the people they represent. They did their job. We expect they would. And union members come in all party persuasions from the far left to the far right. Uh, so hopefully you're, you're helping us make that record, additionally making the record that this is not a partisan issue of Republicans versus Democrats. We have support on both sides of the aisle in the House and the Senate. And, and lastly, that, uh, that in fact we cannot make you whole by taking away anything from uh, the men and women who are receiving a greater benefit. To make you whole, we have to use other means available either from Congress or with the, uh, the head of the corporation. With that, I recognize the chair for the second. Yes, real quickly, uh, one of the things that uh, Mr. Bloom, who lied to our committee and then said he couldn't remember once he was caught, uh, he was, uh, staff just uh, reminded me, he was the senior advisor to the president of the Steelworkers Union before he got his, uh, his present position. So when you think uh, that there wasn't some politics involved, it's, it's clear as the day is long that it, it, it was definitely involved. I just had one question I wanted to ask Mr. Chairman, and that is, do you have any idea how much it's cost in legal fees uh, the, the, the people who are involved in this lawsuit? Yeah, we're over uh, several million dollars so far, and we've got plenty more if we need it. Okay. I'd like to make the point, if I may, Mr. Burton, that the attorneys have worked with us very strongly and carefully to come up. And our members send in 10, 20, 30 dollars a month, 50 dollars a month to support that. And every bill has been paid. And we're ahead. We're, we're in this. We're going to finish this. And our attorneys are too. Well, I appreciate your dedication, but it's unfortunate that the people who are suffering have to pony up the money for legal fees as well when uh, their opponent, the federal government, is, has unlimited resources. I, uh, I thank all of you for your testimony. Mr. Rose, you included a number of references to other letters that you've received. As I said in the beginning of the hearing, we will leave the record open for five additional days. That would include any and all letters or information from your various members that you'd want to make sure were added to make the record complete. And with, with that, as we take a brief recess to set up the next panel, I want to ask the audience to be just as kind and considerate the people who were obligated to come here to tell what is, to a great extent, the other side of the story. They are career professionals. Their job is not to make political decisions, and they are here at our request to explain what they can and to take candid questions. So I want you to be just as genteel and kind as you've been to the first two panels. <laughs> <laughs> With that, we'll take a short recess. <laughs> Take a whole lot of happy pills, I'll tell you. We're getting thrown out. <laughs> this is terrible. Uh, it, it, as bad as we already know it is, when you listen to this, you just want to throw up. Well, I don't really care. Yeah. No, I